Okay, welcome back after the break. Um, we were uh, looking at um, the King James translation of the Bible and the process and how it uh, happened and how in spite of, um, you know, many uh, Bibles that were there during that time, um, the King James version uh, became um, the version of the Bible that was widely used world over, okay? So, um, uh, and it became like a standard for uh, the Bible translation for many um, centuries, for centuries, okay? And um, we'll move on. Now we'll see a lot of rise of missionaries and missionary movements that come up. Okay, so there was a move of God in that area. So in 1646, we see John Eliot. Anyone knows anything about John Eliot? Like to throw light on John Eliot? Yes, no. You've heard the name? No? Okay. There is no John Eliot in our uh, uh, hanging wall hanging, no, in our uh, Bible college. By the way, uh, online students in our Bible college, we have some of the great uh, missionaries, pioneers of the movements, um, uh, you know, their, uh, their, um, their photo and their name and also uh, a, a statement made by them, which is very encouraging uh, to see. So it's there all over here in our Bible college. So just looking at uh, if there was anything about John Eliot. Okay, he was um, uh, probably the greatest missionary to work among the Native American tribes, okay? Uh, he was not the first, though, but he was one of the greatest. Um, and look at what he did, okay? He printed uh, publications um, for the Native people in their own language, okay? So when he printed about, you know, um, uh, uh, you know, he translated sermons and he printed it in the language of the native Indians, you know, it brought much understanding to them about Christianity. So this was another use of written language. So you see how important it is to uh, write, you know, um, so God can use some of us, he can stir some of your hearts up, uh, to write, you know, the Bible or to translate some of pastor's books into your own language so that people can read it and, you know, or uh, other uh, major books that are there, some good books that people can read, can be translated into your own language of your people group so that people can read and can be blessed. So this is why he's known as one of the greatest missionaries among the Native Americans because he translated many sermons uh, in the language of the Native people and uh, they had a better understanding of Christianity. So that was something that he um, did. Okay. And um, also he translated the Bible into the Massachusetts language and he published it in 1663. Massachusetts is one of the places in America. So that was something that he did. And uh, people had uh, the Bible in their own language, the Native Americans, they could read. Okay, And in 1649, the Missionary Society for the Propagation of the Gospel in New England was founded in Great Britain. Okay, And then in 16, 1650, we see the rise of uh, John, George Fox, sorry, George Fox and the Quakers. Okay, Now, George Fox was uh, the founder of the Quakers. Okay, um, He had a deep desire from childhood to learn spiritual truths okay so um as time went on he you know he went through a period of spiritual struggle just to know god personally and to experience god in a deeper way okay and um uh, the charismatic uh, phenomenon were very common among the early quakers so we see in uh, fox's journal um and Book of Miracles were filled with, he wrote this Book of Miracles his, or his journal, which, you know, book that he kept writing. I don't know how many of you journal means every day you write down in a diary, uh, what are your thoughts, what happened today, what are some things God taught you. I don't know if some of you have 
uh, diaries or journals, but he, uh, you know, he kept accounts of the miraculous healings um, that happened, and um, you know, um, they went through a lot of uh, difficulties during this time. Um, you know, uh, 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 even as he was searching for a deeper relationship with God, it led him to actually reject many of the formal practices of his time. Okay, just rituals that the church was following. He, uh, he did not want to do that. He did not want to follow those things. And Fox, George Fox basically believed that everyone could experience a personal connection with God. And he said, how can everyone experience a personal connection with God? He's saying through the inner light, okay, to the inward communication of God. So basically, maybe the Holy Spirit was speaking to him and he was able to uh, understand the truths of the scripture and God was speaking to him in his inward being. And um, uh, that was what was the heart of the Quaker belief. Okay, so it gave rise to the Quaker movement, and that this is what the Quakers believed. Okay, uh, in Fox's writing, particularly his journal and his book of miracles, it documents many miraculous healings and the charismatic uh, gifts, uh, which is very similar to the Pentecostal and the charismatic movements of today. Um, and these experiences were very common among the early Quakers. And that is what contributed to their rapid growth because they were experiencing um, the, the gifts of the Spirit, the move of the Spirit, miraculous healing. So I think many were coming uh, like um, uh, the, the early uh, the period, the monks that were there, right? We, we, uh, in the 300s. Remember what we studied in the 300s um, about uh, the monks that who were there, uh, who, you know... Um, which AD was that? Um, I don't know which AD, but you know the the rising of the monks who were called as the the desert fathers. You know um, who people came to because they were pursuing God, they were praying, they were fasting, and um, you know um, they were um, great moves of God, and many people were healed. And so we see that the similar thing happening here with the. Um, the Quakers, okay? So, um, the Quakers, but, uh, you know, they face severe persecution and op opposition from religious and political authorities. They were often imprisoned, they were beaten, they were whipped, and in some cases, they were also hanged for their beliefs, okay? Uh, and Fox, George Fox himself, was imprisoned 36 times, because he refused to conform to the state churches and the laws. The, the churches were just doing what the government was saying. They were following the law of the government. And so he refused to believe that. And because of that, he was uh, imprisoned 36 times. He was beaten up along with the, the, uh, his other uh, people of uh, the same similar beliefs and faith. Okay? But we see that despite this persecution, the Quakers' missionaries spread across the world, okay? They spread across the world. Within one generation, they were present, you know, as far as reaching as, the far reaching as Turkey in the East and the American colonies in the West. So they just spread themselves out, just teaching and preaching the word of God and moving in mighty science, miracles and wonders, okay? By 1656, Fox had gathered about 56 uh, Preachers who were traveling along with him, who hel uh, helped him spread the Quaker message. And in 1660, we see just for, in just two de decades, you know, um, after Fox began his ministry, that the Quaker movement had grown um, to 40,000 to 60,000 followers, making it one of the, the, the fastest growing religious movements in the Western world at that time. Okay, so I'm sure this was not just their work, it was the move of the Holy Spirit, just working through them, moving through them powerfully, and um, they were just flowing in science, miracles, and wonders, uh, just, you know, the, the gifts of the Holy um, Spirit, okay? And um, they basically thought about having a personal connection with God, and, uh, you know, how the Holy Spirit communicates 
uh, about God in their inner person. Okay, so, so that was the Quaker movement. Then in 1698, we see the rise of the Missionary Society for promoting Christian knowledge. Um, and then in 1701, we see the Missionary Society for propagation of the gospel in foreign parts to evangelize, you know, the American colonies um, that were founded in Great Britain. Okay, so... Um, uh, during this time in 1726 to 1750 was the first great awakening in Northern America. Okay, so the first great awakening, there's a second great awakening as well. But the first great awakening in Northern America was brought about how God raised up these revivalists, John Edwards and George Whitfield, who were used powerfully during the first great awakening that swept across North America. Okay, now uh, North America was basically colonial rule, the British. Okay, there was wars that were happening, and because of the wars, there was you know moral decline, there was spiritual decline, you know uh, there was a shortage of churches and ministers. There were very few ministers. They were not able to give spiritual care for the people, and many existing churches actually uh, disintegrated into formal religious institution it was just religious they had no you know move of god there was no power of god there was no love of god just being manifested in the churches and uh, you know there was a need for a change and god raised up this revivalist john edwards and george whitfield uh, who were very powerful during the first awakening that swept across north america Okay, so 1735, we read about Jonathan Edwards. Anyone read about Jonathan Edwards before? No? Okay. So Jonathan Edwards, um, you know, basically he saw that there was deadness throughout the land and he set out himself to seek God and for a revival of religion. Okay, and he uh, diligently began to seek God and in 1726, you know, there was a spiritual awakening that broke out, okay, in that the regions in the e uh, Eastern Sea uh, board, okay. And one of the communities that, um, uh, that you know, experienced the outpouring of the uh, Holy Spirit um, was Northampton and Massachusetts. And, uh, you know, these are places in, in America. Okay. And they just experienced the awesome presence of the divine presence of God just, just, you know, just permeated the entire communities. And we see that, you know, um, Edwards, he, he makes this report in the spring and summer of 1735, that the town seemed to be full of the presence of God. Okay, that's how people were just soaking and enjoying the presence of God. And he says, in every part of the town, the Spirit of God was powerfully at work. Okay, and there was not even one single person in the town, young or old, who was left unconcerned about the great things of the eternal world. So everyone in these towns were so caught up with the move of God, just experienced the power of the Holy Spirit moving so powerfully. And they just, you know, were so caught up with the things of God, just reading the word of God, just experiencing the eternal world, uh, so to say. So this is what happens in a revival. Okay, now revival, God can use one person, he can use a community, but see, even without this person doing anything much, how God's revival fire just moved through this entire community and just ministered and overpowered and empowered uh, people so powerfully. Okay, um, and we see that Edwards, you know, he... Um, there was no planned outreach, he says. Okay, there is, we never plan any uh, evangelistic outreach. But he says souls, you know, were just saved and they came in flocks, you know, to Jesus Christ. So this was just the work of the Holy Spirit. Are you all able to see what happens in revival? Remember in chapter one, we talked about how revival happens. We saw that in the early church and how it, you know, uh, what is a move of revival. So one of the things of revival here is that even though there was no evangelistic outreach, people were just 
ministered to. People were just, you know, encountering the presence of God. They were just encountering the the uh, the work of the Holy uh, Spirit. Okay, and we see that Edward says that his church was suddenly filled with those seeking salvation and those already experiencing salvation who are already born again were part of his church so that is what happens in a revival so why should we pray for revival it has a lasting impact okay why should we pray for revival one sermon will be equivalent to what you pray x, x number of uh, sermons okay what you take years to reach your entire community can be reached in a matter of uh, just moments or, uh, you know, not even days or weeks, you know, just uh, even a day, okay? God can just move, okay? So we see that, um, uh, you know, such a great move of God. And, uh, you know, jo uh, Jonathan Edwards was known for his famous sermon, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. That was his uh, sermon. He was known for his sermons, very famous uh, sinners in the hands of an angry um, God. Okay. Um, so we also see that he published, you know, um, uh, a book that was an attempt to just talk about what happens, uh, you know, uh, 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 when God moves. Uh, and also God's, um, when, when people are involved in prayer, how it revives religion and how it advances the kingdom of God. Okay. The other person that God used during this first great awakening between 1726 to 1750 was George Whitfield. Anyone heard about George Whitfield? Oh, there is one uh, wall hanging about George Whitfield. Okay. Okay, fine. George Whitfield was a gifted preacher and uh, he was a powerful communicator. I don't think there's anything in this room about George Whitfield. Okay, he was a gifted preacher and a powerful communicator. Um, basically, he arrived in America in 1739. He traveled the length and breadth of America and wherever he went, you know, whether people were farming or people were indoors or the shopkeepers, everyone would close their shop. They would stop farming, they would stop plowing their fields, or, or if people were working with their tools in the factories, they would leave everything, they would just go to hear him preach his sermon. Yes. What fascinated me just now is that the last statement in the notes, no, that he has preached over 3,000 sermons on the same scripture passage of John 3.3. That, uh, that is George Whitfield. Yes, we're coming to that. Yes. Okay, so he went and he preached, and we see that, you know, um, there are 25,000 people, 30,000 people just came and in Boston and listened to his um, uh, preaching, and his preaching was attested with signs and wonders. This we also see in the early church, yes or no? You know, yes, Jesus' time, early church, whenever they preached, it was attested with signs, miracles, and wonders okay so that also is a, a sign of revival happening when you know preaching is attested with signs miracles and wonders and the power of god would move so spontaneously throughout the congregation even as uh, you know george whitfield um, spoke and you know following his message there was manifestations of the holy spirit would occur uh, one occasion after preaching to a huge you know, a group of people who were gathered outdoors, you know, Whitfield saw the crowd and he noted, you know, the amazing response, okay, that was there among the people, how the Holy Spirit was just moving, working, people were just, uh, you know, receiving Christ, people were healed, people were restored, it was a great move of God. And it is said that he, he would have preached 3,000 sermons on the same scripture passage of John chapter 3 verse Three. Can somebody read John chapter 3, verse 3, please? Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. So he just preached on this uh, 3,000 sermons, and I'm sure, you know, many and many of them were born again. Okay. So sometimes we think, um, should we preach 
same sermon on same scripture passage yes we can because it is a holy spirit who can move differently who can speak who can work in the lives of people okay uh any questions so far anyone wants to say anything online students are very quiet i hope you all are with us or you're lost somewhere in history in time in space i have a question are thank you Lucy, thank you sermons uh, available online or anywhere or their sermons maybe yes. you can you can go online and check um they would have their sermons yes Okay, yeah. Maybe not the recorded ones in YouTube, or somebody would have spoken their message uh, in uh, audio. Some after they died, some of them would have spoken it. So maybe on YouTube, but but you can always read it. Yeah. Any questions so far? You please speak that in the mic, please. Uh, yeah of what we've uh, read today it's like so much of history is dated only towards england i mean originating from there england and america right yes we also see in europe before this we see uh, france and germany and uh, scotland yes it all started there but also moves to the other parts of the world but we see like you know the the quakers take it to uh, turkey and you know to all the other parts of the the world okay uh, but what does it tell us? Revival was and Reformation was basically birth in those parts of the world, right? Uh, America, Europe, England. What do we see today? What do we see today in these parts of the world? We see that Reformation and Revival was birthed so much in these parts in Europe, in America. What do we see today? Yes? There's a backsliding. Backsliding, moral degradation, right? If you go to uh, many parts of Europe, if you go to England, many of these churches, many of these cathedrals that were built have now become uh, pubs, you know? Uh, my sister was saying it's so sad uh, when you go and see that many of those cathedrals and those churches that were built have now become pubs, right? It's very sad to see that, you know, great things that God, great missionaries, great moves of God, great revivals that started in these people have now moved on to Eastern philosophies, to, you know, just uh, accepting uh, you know, all of the philosophies, the ideologies, basically from Indians, you know, all of that. Um, they are so um, quick to, uh, uh, you know, receive all of these cult movements. The churches are so dead in England, in Scotland, in Switzerland, in Germany. Um, of course, God is bringing about a revival, but we need to pray. But we also see that after this time, there was, again, it... You know, even though there was a revival, there was reformation, they even backslide again and how God even raises up people to pray and you know, brings about a uh, revival. So even as we're reading all of these things and seeing all of these things, it's not very different from the times and the culture that we are living today. Yes or no? Yes, there's a lot of moral degradation, uh, spiritual degradation. Um, the churches are not aligning to um, the things of God, to scripture, more to what the government is saying, bringing in, you know, what the, the law of the land is having a control over the churches and, and all of that. And it's very sad, but we can see that even as these things happen in the past and how God moved, we can also believe God and pray and move in for the same thing. Okay. Uh, 1727, we see the Moravian revival in Germany uh, by Zinzendorf. Um, the Moravian church uh, traces its beginnings to uh, John Huss. Okay. Uh, it was a small community of believers uh, who lived in Germany. And look at what uh, happened. They just had a mighty visitation of the Holy Spirit. And what happened to these people? They just did not enjoy that visitation, but they wanted that visitation to become a something that is long-lasting for 
them. They did not just want somebody to come and visit them and go, the Holy Spirit to visit them and go, but they wanted that mighty visitation to linger on, to stay on. And what did they do? Look at what they did. They responded to it. They organized themselves in continuous prayer around the clock throughout the week. So 24 past 7 was prayer that was happening and it continued for how long? 100 years. Wow. 100 years. Just continuous praying 24 7. Right? Just look at these people. They're so hungry for God that they did not just want that visitation to end. They wanted that to becoming to become a, a lasting effect. And that is something else we, we studied in revival. Yes or no? You know, it becomes a lasting impact throughout generations. Okay. And we see that um, the Moravian revival, they sent out so many missionaries far and wide. And uh, we see also this kind of prayer movement birthing in other places as well. Okay. And um, in 1738, the Methodist revival uh, began in England through John Wesley and his brother, Charles Wesley. Okay. Um, they were known as the Methodists because they're very methodical in their approach in seeking God. Okay. Uh, what is their metho methods? They follow every evening from six to nine, they would meet for prayer and Bible study. Every Wednesday and Friday, they fasted. And once every week, they received communion. But we see that none of this really satisfied John Wesley. He felt that it was just like a ritual. And then he went to uh, a mission trip in Georgia. Okay. But it was a failed mission trip. He returned to England and he continued to search for God in a more deeper way. And in 1738, he found an inner assurance. That means he experienced salvation. And then he began preaching justification is through faith. Okay. In Christ Jesus alone. And we see that, you know, he preached how many sermons? 50,000 sermons. And he traveled almost uh, 2 lakh 50,000 miles on horseback. Imagine what a life just, just uh, dedicated to preaching and teaching the word of God and spreading the gospel and teaching this truth that we are justified or made righteous uh, before God through faith in Jesus Christ alone. Okay. So that was um, John Wesley. And we see the profound impact that's had on the, the Methodist church. The Methodist church has also raised up many great men and women of God. You know, I'm one of uh, the people who are part of the Methodist church, um, being spiritually fed and trained and received so much of the Methodist church. But it's so sad to see where the Methodist church is going today and uh, feel like as Methodists, we are burdened. We need to pray that God brings about a revival, a change, and a powerful move of his, uh, the Holy Spirit. There's so much that is happening in the Methodist Church, which is so heartbreaking and so sad. Okay, we'll move on um, uh, to 7, 1741 to 1744, revival in Scotland. Okay, um, it was uh, William who took a responsibility of a small church. And uh, he was not a great preacher, okay? He was very not very eloquent. He was very slow in his preaching. He was not very great. But uh, God still used this man, William, okay? He was inspired by the stories of revival. So you never know that many of you are studying these revival stories. God is taking you through these revival stories for a... For a purpose, maybe God is stirring your heart to pray for revival. Just look at what this man did. He's not a great preacher. He's not a great teacher. He's very slow in preaching and teaching. His son also says he's very slow, you know. But he was inspired by the stories of revival. And what did he do? He read these stories to his small congregation. And all he did was just read the revival stories to his congregation. And he initiated prayer for revival in January 1742. And by July 1742 of that same year, there were daily times of corporate prayer and people calling out to God to work among 
them. Okay, And many of these meetings went through the night. And we see that hundreds of these similar prayer meetings started all over Scotland. And we see that many people were reached in um, Scotland. Okay, So during that time in July 1742, uh, George Whitfield also came to Scotland. And he preached to a crowd of 20,000 people. Uh, and later in August, he preached to a crowd of 30,000 people. And scores of people, that means hundreds of people, you know, scores means like uh, uh, records of people, you know, came under the conviction, fell to the ground weeping and confessing their, uh, their sins. And look at what Whitfield records about these meetings. He says, such a thing I have never witnessed before. The power of God was present. Sorry. The power of God was present from one end of the crowd to the other like a lightning flashing across. You could see thousands bathed in tears, people, thousands of people just crying. Some, you know, their hands are wreathing like this. Their hands were just shaking with the power of God. Others almost swooning, I mean, just crying, falling down on the ground and mourning for their sins and what Jesus had done for them on the cross. So you see the, the, the impact of revival, the move of God. This is what happens, you know, when, when God just moves, there's thousands, the whole, the crowd of people, you know, the power of God just moves. He says that the power of God moves like a flash, lightning, flashing across and thousands are just experiencing the, the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, this prayer movement that was started by William, it spread across Scotland and the entire nation uh, started having these concerts of prayer. Okay, uh, focusing on praying for revival in the church, extending of God's kingdom on the earth. And what began in a small town of a preacher who could not preach well, just spread across the nation and impacted the nation. So you see, God used this one man who was not a great preacher, could not even preach well, very slow in preaching, very soft in preaching. But he just was so moved by the stories of Revival, he just read it out to his people. His people took it on. They just prayed. And so, you know, it birthed revivals. Now we see uh, how are revivals being birthed in this time period? How is revival being birthed in this time period? How is revival birthed during this time period? By speaking about the revival incidents. Yes. Was that the only thing? What was the major thing? It was prayer. Right? Before we saw it was 1,150 to 1,600. It was reading the scriptures. Here it was mainly prayer. This William, he just started a prayer group that spread all across Scotland and see what uh, uh, happened. Okay? Um, we also see Moravian revival. How did it start? How did the Moravian revival start? I just talked to, talk to you about Moravian revival. Prayer, yes. How long did they pray? 100 years, 24 bar, 7. Right? And we see George Whitfield. We see, uh, um, uh, you know, um, Jonathan Edwards also just praying, preaching the word of God. And um, also we see, you know, the others before that, you know, uh, just praying for um, uh, the churches, right? So, great moves of God, uh, chain prayer. Yes, thank you, Deepu. It was just basically chain prayer that started about all of these um, revival movements, okay? Now we'll move on to um, uh, 1741 to 7, sorry. We'll move on to 1742, David Brainerd. Anyone heard about David Brainerd? David Brainerd? 
Okay, David Brainerd was basically orphaned at the age of, that means he lost both his parents at the age of 14. He uh, studied in Yale University, one of the most best and prestigious universities in the world, but he was expelled from that. And then he went on preaching to the Native Americans in New York uh, and then Pennsylvania, but he did not see much success. And then he moved on to uh, preaching the word for the Native uh, Indians in New Jersey between 1745 to 1746 and we see that you know a revival breaks out okay revival breaks out among these native americans and um, there's a great move of god and um, sadly he was he was very unwell okay um, his his uh, life motto was to be to burn out in one continual flame for god just just work for god do your best and just burn out okay so that's what happened i think in age of 29 he was um, he 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 died um, he had tuberculosis he was taken care by jonathan edwards you know who jonathan edwards is right who god used to bring about the first revival in the great awakening the first great awakening okay and um, jonathan edward did something nice he ed he published uh, uh, David Brenner's personal diary and this diary that you know in which David Brenner wrote all about his life his experience his ministry what God had done which was published as a book actually served um, as a, a great book for many future mis missionaries like William Carey and Henry Martin and Jim Elliot who read his uh, his life story and were greatly motivated by his life story and went on also to become great missionaries. Okay, then we come to the second great awakening in 1780 to 1810. Okay, now in um, during this time, the period of 1780 to 1810, uh, in England, there was a significant decline in morality, social conditions, and it is described as one of the lowest points in British history in terms of public behavior and ethics. Okay, so uh, many, what are the things that led to this was there was industrial revolution and because of the industrial revolution, it just changed society. People moved from rural areas to the city to search for work and it led to rapid urbanization. And the cities became very overcrowded. People were living in conditions which were very poor. There were slums that were developing in many areas. And um, there was a, a because sudden urbanization happened, everyone were coming to city life. There was no proper housing. There was no sanitation. There was no social support systems. And because of that, there was a rise in crime, alcoholism, and poverty. Okay. So we see there was also a growing divide between the rich and the poor, okay? So the rich enjoy the luxury and the comfort. The working class people, they just, you know, struggle to survive in harsh conditions. And this led to a lot of desperation and theft that was happening. And so there was a lot of law, uh, lawlessness that, that had risen up, okay? And... Um, there was moral decline, uh, like there was ap alcohol uh, abuse that was very rampant. And because of alcohol and drunkenness, there were other social problems. Prostitution was very widespread. Um, and it was, you know, the immorality reached the whole time high. Okay. And also this time of the Second Great Awakening, it had a great influence on the Church of England. Okay. Um, Many people turned away from the church because they felt the church was disconnected to the struggles and the problems that they were going through. Okay, um, and they felt the church was more consider, considered to the considerate to the richer class, the wealthy, than the lower class, the middle class, and they were not addressing the moral and the social issues that the people were facing during this time. So people disconnected from the church, they were not going, there was spiritual emptiness, and there was a lot of lawlessness and moral confusion, okay? And also during this time, there was war. England was engaged in a series of war during this time, uh, including there was the American War of Independence and all of that thing. So all of this had an impact on the 
society, the economy, and um, you know there was uh, the lower class, the middle class had no means to educate their children. So all of this was a great problem that was happening during the second awakening. So what do you uh, learn about this, the second great awakening? What can we see? How can we relate it to our present day time? A lot of new things happening compared to what earlier happened. Okay. How is it similar to our time and day today? Come on. I just ran through all that happened during the Second Great Awakening. What are the similarities? Prayer and other things that... Are no, in terms of the history, moral, political economic things that are happening. Uh, there is no morality now. Yes, there's a... Uh, there's a lot of uh, scandals, a lot of uh, uh, sexual abuse and uh, such going on. Yes, there's a lot of moral degradation that is happening. Morality is on a whole time low. No ethical moral values. It's very sad and surprising. Uh, you know, uh, shocking to read some of the things that we see in the news, in the newspaper. What else? Yes, people are moving out from places in search of jobs. We see many, especially in, uh, in India, we see many people coming from many villages and towns to the city and cities are becoming more cramped and uh, there is a great divide between the rich and the poor. And so the poor are getting into a lot of, you know, lawless deeds. There's a lot of alcoholism. And because of that, there is a lot of rape and abuse that is happening. Um, also, there is theft. Yes, there is murder because of theft. So all of these things we see even in our city, Bangalore. Yes or no? Yes, there's also bad addictions that are happening. Yes. There's a lot of industrial revolution that is happening. People are looking for jobs. And what about the church? What do you think is happening to the church similar to what is happening in the Second Great Awakening? Some churches are growing in the power of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. And some other areas of churches are just a formal type of worship and uh, just, uh, reading the scriptures is happening. Yes, just following liturgy, you know, rituals. What else? What's happening? A with lot of persecution also is going on. Okay, persecution is happening. What else is happening in the churches? You see, many people are disconnecting from churches. Yes or no? Why? There's a lot of divisions happening in the churches. There's a lot of fighting. There's a lot of uh, money laundering, uh, land grabbing. And people are really fed up, right? And people are saying, hey, we come to church. Spe specifically, many of them leaving our mainline churches and going to many uh, charismatic uh, churches. Why? Hello, all this is very important for all of you. Why are many leaving my mainline churches and going to charismatic because churches? Because of the politics, what they, what is happening for the sake of the, um, means to serve God, they, they elect people. Yes, a lot of politics. Yes, they bribe and such things are happening. So there's a move from the such mainline churches to the charismatic churches. Yes. Also, Daniel says money business, churches become more a money business because people are getting weary and angry and irritated because every time they go to church, it's all about give money. We want to build this project. We want to do this. We want to do that. We want to support this. We want to support that. People are saying, hey, you're not taught the word of God, right? If you go to many of these churches, you can just go there and you can fall asleep nicely. Right, it, it is so dead, so spiritually dead, and um, uh, you know, lethargic uh, spiritual lethargy that is there. So, there's a revival. So, even as we're looking at uh, you know, church history, I want you to connect 
the dots and see hey this happening in this happened in the uh, you know the great second great awakening it's happening even today i can see our world happening like this you know there's you know um, uh, 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 behavior public behavior is in an all time low morality is also in a low all time uh, low also we see that you now we see many of the um uh, the uh, many of the churches the government is coming in to bring about law and order in the churches so i'm hearing from our mainline churches you know csi uh, this uh, also in the methodist so much of land grabbing so many things that are happening the government is getting involved the court is getting involved they are going to take away the lands they are overseeing the property they are seeing overseeing the lands and it's so sad because we have not been good stewards of what has been entrusted to us it's so sad that many of these missionaries came gave their life gave their you know their hard earned money brought property here and how people now are just using it to sell it uh, you know to hold money for them sell so if you see all of this is happening and people are not coming to some of them are not coming to church because they're not receiving the spiritual food they're going through situations there's adultery there's immorality there's divorces on a all time rise children are suffering you know um, there is no family peace there's family discord they come into church they want to hear something they want to receive the peace of god they want to receive a move of god they want answers to their problems they come into church and they're not getting that and they they say might as well not go to church they're looking for answers elsewhere and they're getting the wrong answers from the world and we see many of them going astray so what is another awakening for us as a church as people of god what is this time calling us to do more accountable to god to be more responsible because to be stewards of what god has given us these things which are going around right now the which are in the prevalent uh, prevalent times is the reason is as it's not external it's more of internal yes what else to intercede for our nation yes it's time to intercede for our nation i'm sure when we intercede when we pray we see you know how god moves we've seen how god moves just in scotland in other places as well germany right what else all churches coming together in unity even if that doesn't happen we just have to pray you know what else preach the scripture pure full gospel from the pulpit and connect it to people's present situations right we need to connect it to people what they are going through minister to them so even as you are called we are called to preach and teach yes we teach the pure gospel but we connect it to people's situation what they're going through we know what's happening in bangalore we know what people are going through in bangalore so when they come to church give them the word of god right and not just the word of god but pray that your preaching and teaching will be as attested with signs miracles and wonders people experience the power and the move of god right we'll stop here anyone has any questions Any questions? So two things we learned to birth revival, reformation, to pray and to read the scriptures. Right? You never know; God can use you to uh, translate the scripture in your own tribal languages, your own people group languages, to translate some of these publications, like Kingdom of God. the no holy spirit the gifts of the holy spirit into the language of your people groups that they can read it to go back and teach your people from these you know from the word of god from what you're learning from the course content course material you know and just pray for a move of god and a revival amen okay any questions okay, if there's no questions we'll end class thank you everyone for joining class god bless